Thank you very much, John, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I guess I'd like to start first by congratulating uh, this year's inductees to the Canadian Academy. Um, as I think Paul Rochon said to us last night, we sort of um, account for each other by peer review, as he put it. Um, and I think there's no greater honor, if you're an academic, <clears throat> a researcher, to be honored by your peers. So congratulations to all the new inductees. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to congratulate the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Um, I remember when, when Marty Schechter and, and Paul Armstrong were banging on my door when I was at CIHR uh, asking for both verbal and other kinds of support. And I was <coughs> a little skeptical <coughs> that this baby would actually survive, uh, but here we are today, and, and I think it's, it's been terrific. Uh, and so congratulations to CAHS. I think it's just fantastic. And of course, I'm uh, deeply honored uh, to be asked to, to have been asked to give the inaugural Cy Frank uh, lectureship. Uh, uh, as John just told you, Cy and I went back, go back to about 16 years ago when I first met him uh, as a, during an interview process for the 13 scientific directors, and one of them is sitting in the front row here. Uh, and I didn't know Cy. Uh, that was one strike against him, I guess, and he was an orthopedic surgeon, which was the second strike against him. Uh, but his colleagues told me that Sai was uh, a committed and outstanding researcher, uh, committed to excellence, uh, and a great leader. And so he became the inaugural scientific director for the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis, uh, IMHA, as we affectionately called it. Um, and I think those of you who interacted with Sai will know that Sai had this, I think, almost unique ability to create a big tent. Uh, I think everybody who interacted with him, both within the research community, within uh, the health charities in this country and industry, uh, academia and government, uh, I think all felt they belonged uh, when Sai was sort of leading a discussion or trying to move somewhere. Um, I, and, and I think he stood out in my mind uh, it, 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 with that unique ability uh, amongst everybody I've interacted with. Now, Sai wasn't a sponge. You know, he wasn't simply soaking in stuff and throwing it back. Sai um, actually had a clear idea of where he wanted to go. But he was a great listener, and he had this ability to incorporate people's very diverse views into, uh, into where he wants to go. And I thought I would just read a quote, actually, from Sai himself. Uh, when he first became president of the Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, which I think captures the man, both as, an as a human being um, and as a scientist and as a leader, uh, not just in Alberta, but in the country. Here, here's the quote. And this was his first message when he first became president. We have a responsibility to Albertans to show we're making a difference in their lives. That's kind of a rephrasing of the CAHS kind of tagline, actually. Um, the best way we can uphold that responsibility is to make it a shared one whenever possible. So, so I believed in sharing. We all have a role to play in unleashing opportunities for innovation, no matter if we are researchers, students, administrators, clinicians, policy makers, patients, funders, industry partners, or frontline health professionals. So that's that size big tent uh, at work there. Working in community through engagement in collaborations in partnership where ideas, resources, and expertise can cross-fertilize, this is how we will have an impact. Together, we will make a difference in the lives of Albertans. I think that really captured uh, Cy Frank. And that was, uh, I know he agonized over that first message. He sent me a draft, actually, by email beforehand. Um, and uh, here we are. Now, when, uh, uh, but a year before Cy passed away, I decided it would be timely to have a reunion of what he called the CIHR originals, which Diane will remember well. And it was uh, the executive team at that time uh, when I was president and uh, the 13 scientific directors and a few others. And we had had a great uh, retreat in Banff. And so I thought we should have it in Alberta. And since Cy was head of AIHS in Alberta, he would be the logical person to, to organize it. So I asked him to do it. Um, and he, he did just a fabulous job 
of bringing together a, a, a group of people organizing the whole thing um, and making it both fun and also quite valuable, I think, for all of us in terms of coming together. And, and I knew he would, so it was sort of an obvious you know, sort of thing to ask him to do it. So um, that was Cy Frank, and I'm deeply honored, as I said, to be giving this uh, inaugural legacy lectureship. Of course, Cy was no stranger to CAHS. He was a member, he was a fellow. Uh, he also led the first major assessment uh, here at uh, CAHS on a return on investments in health research, uh, 2009, as I recall. So um, uh, he was certainly very supportive, and he was on the executive. He was very supportive um, of this organization. So uh, I'd like to talk about two things, which I know were uh, near and dear to Sai's heart. Uh, one was, one is um, uh, the revolution that's going on in health research. Uh, uh, to sort of set the stage. Uh, and then secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, science and innovation policy um, in general, and certainly in this country, particularly as we go through this uh, reinvigorating of, uh, of research uh, with this new government and the review that's un under, being undertaken, chaired by David Naylor, and the fundamental uh, landscape for the funding of fundamental research uh, in this country. So let's, let's go to the first part first. I do believe that there is a, a revolution going on in health research. And I think it cuts across um, what was originally called the four pillars uh, or the four themes of, of health research. And my thesis is going to be to cut to the chase that th those four pillars or four themes were originally conceived of back, you know, X years ago as being um, orthogonal to each other. That is, four different silos that all had to be represented within health research. In fact, before, before CHR actually launched in 2000, the Interim Governing Council had, had serious discussions, uh, long discussions, about whether there should be a pre-allocation of the budget of CHR, Len, you'll be interested in this, of 25% to each of the four pillars. So, Implicit in that, without getting into the merits or not of, of that kind of formulaic approach, but implicit in that is an assumption that those are quite independent kind of thrusts within CIHR. Um, and I, I'm going to argue today that, um, in fact, we're moving towards a period, an exciting period, I think, especially for young people, um, where there'll be a single pillar uh, called health research. And it will not be possible really to do frontline uh, health research, not just in Canada, but anywhere, without incorporating perspectives and uh, expertise and technologies fr from across the, the pillars. And, and so we'll come to that. So let's kind of dissect it a little bit. Um, first, I think there is a revolution going on in biomedical research. Um, in so pillar one, if you will. Um, when I first started a couple of years ago in, ca in cancer research, um, we knew absolutely nothing about the cancer cell and, and why cancer cells behave differently than normal cells. It was a black box. Uh, and as a result, I think we had really no way forward in terms of thinking about progress in terms of preventing, diagnosing, or treating cancer. I think it's fair to say, we had a little bit of a discussion at the reception last night about this, I think it's fair to say that we've made a lot of progress uh, in the ensuing uh, few decades. Um, we actually now, I think, understand in intimate molecular detail um, a lot, not all, but a lot of the uh, molecular underpinnings that drive the aberrant behavior of cancer cells compared to their normal counterparts. And I think it's important to understand how that revolution happened, um, because I think it does impinge on science and innovation policy. So, you know, back in the 70s, uh, President Nixon, uh, President of the United States, of course, um, announced the war on cancer um, and put a lot of money into, into that war on cancer. The bulk of that money went into testing uh, chemicals for their ability to kill cancer cells uh, from cancer cell lines. And there was um, hundreds of millions of dollars actually went into that. I think it's fair to say, I didn't have time to check my history completely, uh, but uh, I, I think it's true to say that actually nothing came out of that. So how, how did we get where we are today, where, for example, if you um, are a woman with breast cancer, 
almost the first thing that's done is you're tested to see whether you're HER2 HER positive or not. And if you are, you're treated with a, a monoclonal antibody uh, called Herceptin. So how, how, did we, how did we get to Herceptin and HER2? Uh, it actually wasn't from direct funding uh, from the war on cancer. Uh, it actually, and this was you know, where my little intersection of my own career comes in, um, it was a small group of, of scientists uh, in the US and in the UK who were working on an obscure group of viruses that cause cancer in chickens, avian retroviruses. Um, and the oncogenes that those viruses have captured uh, from normal cells which get mutated and then cause cancer when they're reintroduced back into normal cells that actually um, led to the discovery of, of HER2. Because HER2 is actually called HER2 not because it's HER, i.e. Uh, women, but it stands for Human Erythroblastosis Receptor. And the, er, the E in HER came from a virus, a chicken virus called AEV, avian erythroblastosis virus. And the, the chicken guys who were working on that virus called that the oncogene, the cancer gene in that virus, herb B2, erythroblastosis B2. The two is because there was two forms of the gene. Um, and the human counterpart was then called HER2. And then it was shown that that gene was amplified in women with breast cancer. So it was a very indirect assault on cancer. Nobody who, who was thinking about funding cancer research and translational research and direct research would have funded that work on avian erythroblastosis virus. By and large, retroviruses don't cause cancer in humans, and who cares about chickens? <laughs> right? So, so um, I think there's a lesson there, and I think the lessons are several fold, and you can all draw your own conclusions from it. But my conclusion from it is uh, you fund excellence. You fund really the best people um, uh, who have the, the smell and the, and the, and the kind of a sense of, of where things are going to go, and you never know where they're going to go. And of course, uh, Harold Varmus and Mike Bishop, uh, amongst others, won the Nobel Prize in part not for Herb B2, but for earlier work on SARC uh, for their work uh, on avian retroviruses. Okay, so uh, what are the implications uh, then, then going forward? Well, let's contrast cancer now with um, another group of diseases. I've already insulted orthopods, so I'm not gonna insult psychiatrists, but but because uh, this is not meant to be an insult to a psychiatrist. But if you can contrast cancer, which I think we know a lot about today, with mental illness, I, I would submit that we know very little about psychiatric disorders, in fact, in general, disorders of the brain. Um, and as a result, we have really no profound, effective way forward. Whereas in cancer, I think we do have a rich palette of technologies and techniques and programs uh, going forward uh, uh, in this area. Um, and it's like, you know, mental illness is, are complex. They're really complex. Uh, and the brain itself is complex. Uh, but I'm actually very optimistic um, that we will make tremendous progress over the next X years in our understanding of the brain and therefore our understanding of psychiatric disorders because of exactly the same kinds of research uh, that led to our understanding of the cancer cell. Uh, and what course that will take, of course, I don't know. If I knew, I, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be in the lab working away. Uh, so I, I think, I think we, we have reason for optimism. But exactly what that course will be, as I've just said, I don't know. And so I think the, the, the challenge for funders and the challenges for governments is to recognize we don't know our way forward. And so the best way forward is to fund excellence in science. Uh, because we don't know what... Now, with cancer, I wouldn't quite say the same thing, actually. Um, I think it is not inappropriate now to have more of a top-down approach to cancer research. Um, because we do have a lot of the targets, uh, as they, uh, they're called in, in the biopharma industry, uh, for developing drugs. And indeed, there is a lot of money going uh, into academia and into the biopharmaceutical sector in funding exactly uh, sort of drug discovery programs to develop drugs. Uh, I'm not arguing, by the way, for investigator-initiated versus a top-down approach. I do not believe that those are mutually exclusive uh, uh, things. I think that's a false dichotomy. And I think we have too many false dichotomies in our debates in academia about the funding of research. 
But I think in, in mental illness and in the brain, I'm not convinced that we're at a time when, when we can really think about both kinds of approaches. I think it's a little bit too early uh, in, in neurological research. Okay, so um, what other um, uh, trends are there in, in health research? Well, uh, let's go to the other pillars. I think we're in a profound revolution also in epidemiolo epidemiological research, um, in health services research, and public health research. Uh, I'll just give, uh, you know, and I think, again, I didn't make this point, but I think Canada, um, largely because of funding through CIHR, is a major leader in all four pillars, including in epidemiological research. And uh, Salim Youssef is not here, but he is a fellow of this academy. Uh, Salim is, of course, one of the world leaders in uh, teasing out some of the risk factors, uh, socioeconomic risk, risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Uh, various studies that he's funded, Hope, uh, I can't remember all the names of his, his trials, but they all have nice names, um, uh, uh, that he's led with colleagues from around the world, hundreds of colleagues from around the world uh, you know, in those studies. Um, and I think where we're going to start to see, um, and also, of course, before I, before I leave that, uh, in health services research, and many of you who have been inducted this year, I notice, are health services researchers. Uh, I think it's very timely because uh, our Canada's Minister of Health, Jane Philpott, has called specifically on increased innovations in the healthcare system. Innovations require evidence, uh, re reprising a theme that Jocelyn just, just raised. Uh, innovations require evidence and data. Uh, Paul Rochon touched on that last night in his remarks to us. Um, and I think this is a great time to be a health services researcher where there is an appetite now and an appreciation and an understanding of the importance of evidence and creative models of thinking about new ways of approaching uh, health delivery, health care, uh, health services, uh, and our health system as a whole in this country. And of course, Sai was passionate about this issue, totally passionate about this issue. Um, he and I had many talks about Alberta. I would, I'm on a committee in Alberta, uh, and we would, Sai and I would meet when I was, would be out there, and we would talk about the idea of Alberta being a living lab. And my argument to Sai was, Alberta is sort of the Goldilocks size. It's not too big, it's not too small. It's exactly the right size to actually experiment, to actually try alternative methods of healthcare delivery and evaluate them. Don't just try them because you think they're nice. Evaluate them, it's a science. Um, and, and Sai, I, I'm not claiming he did it because of me, because Sai was there way before me. Uh, Sai started with colleagues, a whole lot of experiments within Alberta of new ways of experimenting with healthcare delivery, um, which I, I think should not go unfinished. They're too important for this country uh, just to sort of do things the way we did it before. There's too many changes going on in the technologies and expectations of the public, etc., uh, just, just to leave it. So I think we're going to see increasingly a fusion, and I'll touch on one example, of, of all those themes into one. Uh, and I'll go back to psychiatric disorders. I think we all, any of you who've had colleagues or friends or relatives who've had a severe psychiatric uh, incident or suffer from psychiatric illness will know, uh, or, or should know, I think, that those illnesses arise not just anecdotally, but there's good evidence, from a complex interplay between our, between our genetics and our life experiences. And to have uh, study one and not the other is to look at the, you know, the tail of the elephant because it's easy to look at, as opposed to looking at the elephant. We, we need a holistic science that looks at the comp this complex interplay, and it's hard. Uh, there are people who are skilled in genomics, there are people who are skilled at looking at the socioeconomic determinants of health um, and, and experiences that, uh, that happens uh, in one's lifetime, but there's very few people as individuals who can do both. But that's the way we're going to tease out, I think, the risk factors underlying psychiatric illnesses. I'm giving that as an example, by the way. Um, and so, of course, that means we need teams. And I think increasingly we are going to see, um, are seeing, actually, team research, interdisciplinary team research, um, and international teams, increasingly. And I think there are three drivers for it. Uh, the, the first is uh, that problems don't, in, in health and actually in any area of science, don't neatly fall within a discipline. Why, you know, why should they? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, disciplines are an artifact. Um, uh, secondly, 
um, the technologies that are available today to us, whether they're laboratory-based, computational-based, uh, population-based, are so complicated, so sophisticated, that no one individual, no one group, no one lab can actually master all of those technologies. So we need to collaborate. And the third reason is it's doable. We have email. We have the web. It's as easy to communicate with somebody halfway around the world as it is with somebody down the hall. In fact, in some cases, it's easier for various reasons. <laughs> OK, so um, I think that's what we are seeing. I think our physicist colleagues discovered that a long time ago. Um, I think that's happening now in health research. And I think there are huge implications um, for how we train young people. Uh, for promotion for our universities, for promotion and tenure committees, for how we review grants, how we fund science in this country. So that brings me to the next part of my talk, the last part of my talk, which is about uh, the funding of fundamental research. And, and um, uh, our Minister of Science, Kirsty Duncan, asked David Naylor and a group of uh, eminent colleagues uh, to review the, the funding of, of science in this, in this country. So I think it's a great idea. It's timely. It's been over 20 years since the uh, government in the 90s started to reinvest um, in research. And that's led to, I think, a, a huge proliferation of agencies and programs all involved in the funding of science in this country. And it's timely to have a look at where we are and where we should be going. I think that review should ask what I'm calling kind of a pre-question, which is, why do we fund science at all in Canada? What's, what's our goal? So form follows function. So before we decide the form, I think we should decide the function. Um, and I think we should look at international trends, of course, and what can we learn from those international trends uh, uh, for a country uh, like ours. So I think the, the, the reason to, inf to invest in research uh, is sort of some of its in size report, actually, back in 2007 or 2009 on, on the ROI of investments in health research. Um, I think the reasons are that, you know, we need science and research more broadly to drive evidence-based health, evidence-based health care and advances in health. That's what it's all about. And, you know, I could quote lots of statistics, lots of statistics of how research has really transformed health and transformed health care and improved our economic and social and health well-being. But I'll just quote one because it's the sort of the most dramatic we're coming up to Canada's 150th birthday in a few months. The average lifespan of a Canadian over the 150 years since Canada has been in existence has doubled. I mean, think about that. That's an incredible statistic. It's doubled. The average lifespan, if you're born today, of a, of a Canadian is 81, 82. Back 150 years ago, it was around 40. The stats weren't quite as good 150 years ago, but let's, it's about 40, okay? Um, and 40 wasn't bad, actually. You know, uh, we always say, well, Mozart died very young. He died at 34, okay? Mozart died at the average age of a European of his day, 34. I, I think we'd all be dead. <laughs> I would be, for sure, several times over. So... Uh, uh, that statistic, so the next question, of course, is how did that happen? It all happened. It all happened, 100%, because of research. And it happened because of two kinds of research, which is embodied in the vision for CIHR. It happened because of population health, and it happened because of biomedical research. The population health aspect was an understanding of the, the importance of hygiene, uh, at the time of birth, the time of operations, throughout our life. And the hygiene, importance of hygiene came out of work from biomedical research, going back to Pasteur and Koch and others, about the germ theory of disease, which led eventually, you know, 20 years, 30 years later, to vaccines and antibiotics. So our doubling of our lifespan came 100% from research. So we have nothing to be embarrassed about or ashamed about when we talk to our politicians about the importance of health research. I don't know how to put an economic value on 40 years of one's life, but it's huge. And it probably is orders of magnitude greater than our country's total investment in health research over the last you know, 40 years. Okay, so um, I think that's a, a, a if, if, amongst other things, and I could go on and on about it, the, the reason why should we, we should be investing in health research. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Let me just talk about what is the government's role in funding of research. Research is important. I think I've hopefully convinced you of that. If I can't convince you, who can I convince? Uh, I'm talking to the converted, as they say. Um, so what's the government's role? Well, in two words, keep it simple. I think it's to complement what industry does, and it's to de-risk. Complement and de-risk. And I would submit that that's not our government policies at the moment. Um, it's, a, it's a duplication policy, not a complement policy. What real uh, international companies want and what startup companies need is not bringing academia and industry closer together. Actually, quite the opposite, I think. I think what industry wants is the next platforms, is the next breakthroughs, is the next new ways of thinking that they can take advantage of to get a competitive edge. They don't necessarily need, uh, they'll take it, but they don't need the short-term research questions that address their issues of today. That doesn't give a competitive advantage. And indeed, if you look at the data over the last 20 years, and I'm not going to go through it, you will see that that's borne out. Okay, so I think our policies as a nation in funding of research should be to encourage the absolute best fundamental research high risk, high payoff, high impact research that we possibly can, not just in health, but across the board, physics, math, chemistry, the social sciences, and humanities. And the reason for that is because industry won't do that. It can't, and it shouldn't. It's too, it's too long term, it's hard to justify to a board of directors, there's no immediate payoff. So who's gonna do that research? Only one payer can fund that kind of research, and that's government. Only one payer can fund the, the breadth of research that's so important uh, in health research. Um, if you think about it, uh, again, going back to what happens at the clinic, advances in the clinic, think about diagno diagnostics, so ultrasound and NM MRIs, all came out of physics. Okay, uh, infectious disease, some of, pe some of you got, uh, were inducted for your work in infectious disease. Infectious disease, uh, at the clinical level these days, is partly about looking on a Petri dish, it's partly about DNA sequencing. It wasn't funding d infectious disease research that led to DNA sequencing. And so only governments can fund that broad spectrum of research. No company can do that. And so the best way to help a company is to fund that kind of research. Uh, that broad spectrum, high risk, high payoff research. And, and a good company will take it up. And that's what we see happening largely, unfortunately, not in this country, but south of the border, south of our border. Um, and of course, young people today are profoundly different, I think, than certainly when I was a young person, in terms of their entrepreneurial spirit and their, their eagerness to benefit society through moving their work in the lab or in their group out into the healthcare system, out into the public, out into industry. I think it's a totally different generation of young people. And we need not, to, we don't, the worst thing we can do is turn them off, turn off their entrepreneurial spirit. I think the best thing we can do is encourage them to benefit society by doing great research, by funding them at the levels they need, by funding them at all, first of all, giving them the level of funding they need, and then encouraging them to move that into, you know, in quotes, the real world. Um, we, you know, we have a, we started a new program at CIFAR called the Israeli Global Scholars Program. It's for assistant profs, basically. And we asked them to write a two or three pager about what they're doing outside of academia. We have their CV, so we didn't need that. So what are you doing outside of academia? So one young woman, a social scientist from the States, because we fund all over the world, said, well, she hasn't had much of a chance to do much. She's just starting out her academic career. So she's only made presentations so far to the UN Development Program, to the World Bank, and to WHO. Uh, but she was very apologetic, but she's hoping she can do more as she gets more established. <laughs> you know, I thought back, when I was an assistant prof, <sighs> you know, <laughs> no, so, um, I think the role of government is to complement, not to duplicate, and to de-risk. And governments do de-risk industry, even if they fund outstanding science, because they fund that early stage science that industry can't. And secondly, they train the talent. Third, they provide the infrastructure for doing that research. But governments also have a role in innovation. 
They can also de-risk there, and I'm not going to go into any detail now because of time, about how they can de-risk innovation. But I think we need to encourage startup activity, and we need to make sure that young, that startups in this country actually have a chance to grow in this country. And I think there are policies that can be put, and money that can be put on the table to, uh, to help that happen. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to sum up. Um, let me just uh, say, I think we are in a very exciting time uh, uh, in this country. Um, I actually did want to say, touch on, on as, I, as I close, on something that uh, certainly my friend and colleague, Alain Baudet, knows a lot about, and that is the concern about peer review in this country. Um, and I agree with the tweet that CHR put out, Alain, that, that it's great, I think, that the health research community has become so engaged in this issue of peer review and is so engaged, period, uh, particularly, again, young people. I think that's a new phenomenon. Um, and I'm very pleased the way how that whole discussion has, has unfolded. But I, I would submit, and you may not all agree with this, but that's okay, um, I would submit that peer review is not the issue in this country. It's not the long-term issue in this country. The long-term challenge in this country for us as a community is to convince our funders, our partners, the public, of the values of investments in research, of ensuring that young people in this country actually have an opportunity to start up their careers in health research, of moving away from, I think, is another false uh, dichotomous uh, conversation around fundamental versus applied research versus translational research versus clinical research. And you can think back to my HER2 example, for example. Um, and I think move forward with the international trends and where health research um, is going. Those, to me, are the real long-term challenges uh, in this country, uh, amongst others. Um, and, and how do we interface between academia as a community now, not as government, but as, as academia, between what we're doing and should be doing and what Canada needs, both in its health system, in its innovation system, um, and, and what the public wants from us. So I think these are, these are the real long-term challenges. They're not new ones, actually, uh, but they remain, I think, the long-term challenges. And how do we accommodate all the fundamental changes that are going on in health research that I alluded to uh, at the beginning of my time, uh, of my talk? So I think we're going through a profound series of changes. Um, let me just make some opening remarks that I've actually, closing remarks that I've actually uh, written down. Um, I think it's going to require leadership uh, uh, from all of us. I think that leadership uh, should put forward to the Naylor panel, to our Minister of Science, to our Minister of Industry, Science and Economic Development, a bold vision for health research and how it can help this country, a forward-looking vision that isn't immersed in debates about peer review, that's an inward-looking kind of discussion, but rather how can health research can benefit Canada. Uh, I think we need the kind of leadership that Cy Frank showed uh, when he was with us uh, uh, for too few years. So thank you for your attention and for this opportunity to meet on your side. We have time for one or two questions or comments. And uh, Keish Basson, uh, University of Saskatchewan. Alan, thank you very much for that great talk. So one question I had, um, I agree with your hypothesis around the role of government, but governments work in four to five year cycles between elections. And research and science, as we all know, are long term investments. Yes. How do we deal with that? Because, you know, when I deal with the provincial government in Saskatchewan on a regular basis, um, that's always the debate because they're in, they, they say, well, what can we achieve, Quiche, in the first four, in four or five years when I'm talking about 30, 40, 50 year long term investments? Yeah. Um, well, Paul Rochon pointed out that that challenge for us last night, actually, in his remarks. It's a tough one. Uh, you know, one of the little stories I like to tell about during my time at CHR was uh, I was in front of the Finance Committee and a member of Parliament, a member of that committee, uh, his name was Mr. Pilateri, asked me uh, th exactly this question. He put it qu somewhat differently. So how come it takes so long for investments in health research to pay off? 
And I said to him, well, Mr. Pilateri, from your name, I assume that you're the family involved with uh, the winery in Niagara-on-the-Lake. And he said, yes, very proudly. And I said, so then you know that great wine comes from old vines. <laughs> and so the sooner you plant them, the sooner you'll get a, a harvest that actually can, can give you uh, great, great wine, but you don't get it in the short term. Um, and so while our politicians, yes, work on electoral cycles, I actually, maybe I'm naive on this, but I'd like to think that our best politicians understand that their role in the country as a member of parliament um, is to look to the long-term future of the country. And I'm not disagreeing with what, what uh, Dr. Rochon said yesterday, but I, I think that the best politicians have both a short and a long-term view. Uh, Sid Kennedy, Toronto. So, Alan, thank you for an excellent visionary talk. Um, and I wanted to also acknowledge the mental health references. Yes. Uh, good to hear. So if I could just take um, Tom Insull as an exemplary uh, person. So as you probably know, in his NIMH leadership, he was very much um, involved in the creation of research domain criteria, RDOC, and the pursuit of personalized medicine. So now he is part of Alphabet Health with Google and the world of big data. So my question is really, and I think this perhaps goes well beyond mental health, but where do you see the uh, should the investment be more in one, both, or how do you see the relationship between the two? Well, it's, uh, thank you, Sid, for that question. I think it does speak exactly to the point I was trying to make, that only governments, in the beginning at least, can, fund, can fund, in this case, across the, the landscape, between the, the biomedical research, including genomics and cell biology, et cetera, et cetera, the big data research, that uh, big data infrastructure and research that needs to go on, because precision medicine requires big data. Um, and I spent a good part of yesterday with uh, a group that CIFAR has funded for a long time in artificial intelligence. Uh, Canada is the leader in deep learning because of actually before I got there, uh, because of CIFAR's investments in AI in, in Toronto and at the Université de Montréal. And um, you need AI, you need deep learning actually to sift through all that data, to actually see information, not just data. So which company 10 years ago would be investing in AI, big data, and biomedical research, not even Google? And Eric Schmidt, the president of Google, was, is here in Montreal um, and was meeting with our AI guys to actually discuss that in part yesterday with the prime minister, actually. So, you know, only governments can fund that spectrum, that broad spectrum of research. And, and so what Google wants is for government to do that. Google does not need governments to say to a, a prof at University of Montreal, please collaborate with Google on its problems for next week. And that's the surest way, by the way, to turn off young people. Mm -hmm. Young people want to change the world. They don't want to solve Google's problems for next week. 